So, nightmares and bad dreams aren't anything new for anyone. Especially nowadays, how the world tends to be going. But, while growing up, I'd regularly freak out my parents, or wake them up in the middle of the night with one problem or another. Usually, it'd be a bloody nose, and oddly enough, if I ever have one, it's always my left nostril. While in grade school, I hated the windows in my bedroom at night, and would always be trying to lock them. Eventually, my folks told me that I need to keep them clear in case of a fire and needed another exit. So, instead, I ended up nailing the curtain shut, figuring if it was bad enough and I had to get out, I could tear them free. Anytime vehicle lights passed by the curtains, the hairs on the back of my neck would stand up, let alone any light that didn't make sense. And to try and help get over my phobia, my mother would rarely wait until about dusk and try to talk through the window. Hysterics usually followed. It was never just a solid bright white light either. Generally, when the terrifying to curious light came in, it flowed like water of that of a tendril, like from the movie Abyss, when the water was exploring around the deep sea station. However, it was like prismatic dots that moved as one, and dancing around the inside of my room, like an aurora borealis. But the lights didn't shine out onto nearby things. They did not reflect off glass or radiate on the walls or ceilings. I'd even greet the dancing light sometimes. Hi guys, is what still comes to memory. While this sounds lighthearted, the feeling of having my covers ripped off my body in the middle of the night, followed by knowing there was something, not just in my room, but looming close, still gives me a cold pang of fear. Those nights didn't have dazzling light shows, but rather darkness and the looming sense of something or someone just within arm's reach. Thankfully, I am a so-called experiencer. I think any memories of procedures or being in a ship seems like vacant holes or perhaps covered for my own good. Generally, my memories are before or after potential abductions. After moving from my childhood home and into a duplex during high school, two other types of possible dreams events immediately come to mind. On one end, once more lighthearted, I was jumping in my front yard, but the dream-like feel to it was similar to Willy Wonka, where one would be floating upwards. I'd reach out, grab a branch to the tree in my front yard, and drift there for a moment before using the leverage to bound back towards the ground, over and over, until the pulling light in the sky seemed to have play time be over and finally pulled me in a few branches upwards. And generally, when these types of things happened, I blacked out. The instant that joy turned to fear, or the top of the tree rushed by as I went flying upwards. Thankfully, no leaves or branches were in my bed the next morning, though there were scratches up and down my arms, as if I'd been wrestling with a bush. The worst was what most experienced as possible sleep paralysis. Muscles locked, breath quickened, and a general dread of fear. Shadowy figures moving around and giving a sense before or after when they came or when leaving. A visual overload of a tie-dye or kaleidoscope of colors. A few times, my visual senses got overloaded, where newspaper headlines and various articles flooded and flashed overlapping each other within my sight. I don't know if it was a warning, or perhaps brain regurgitating something I picked up that was trying to connect the dots. Now, truth be told, I've always been a fairly straight-edged guy, never even tried psychedelics or any hallucinogenic drugs. The worst drug I'll ever do is a three-way tie between beer, cigarettes, and pot. However, I've never seen anything from those substances, and the marijuana and beer has only been recreationally used in recent years since my experiences 
have all but tapered off. I do have more odd moments with the paranormal and unexplained, but each I've tried to reason away. Just these memories seem to match some of the stories I've heard. I've been wanting to write this email for quite some time. Growing up, my family and I have had frequent visitations from what we call the Translucent Man, going back to all the way when my mother was just a little girl. Their family would have frequent visitations from this being. They're not really sure if it's demonic or if it's possibly an alien. We're not exactly sure, but the very first time was when my mother was around seven years of old. She was outside, playing with her horses. It was around evening time, and her mother and father were getting things cleaned up outside. I should note that these weren't actual horses. They were toy horses, just to clear that up. And as her parents are going in and out of the house, my mother, only being a little girl at the time, looks over towards the woods and sees this weird being coming towards her. She had never seen anything like it before and did not feel immediate fear, but more curiosity. Her father was the next to see it. As he's stepping out of the house, looks up, sees it, begins screaming and panicking, grabs his daughter, aka my mom, pulls her in the house and locks the door, waits for this thing to disappear. As my mother got older, the movie The Predator came out. I'm sure you've seen it. It's one of the most popular from the 1980s with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And there are several scenes in that movie where this predator creature takes on this camouflage, where it almost has this translucent rainbow outline, if that makes any sense. As it's cloaked, it's like the time and space around it is warped, creating almost a translucent, weird warped outline. She said that this translucent man was nearly the exact same, just in the shape of a humanoid figure. But with that same translucent, time-warped space around it being bent shape. And shortly after this, this being began paying almost weekly visits to their house and surrounding land. This is ultimately what confused my mother and her parents. Because it never acted aggressive. It never tried to break into the house. In fact, it never even got close to the house, actually. Like you hear in some stories, being seem pretty hostile, looking in the windows, rattling the doors, trying to break in. But this always kept its distance. But my mother, she just feels like it was lured to us, lured to the house for some reason. She's not sure. After seeing it so many times and knowing it wasn't going to hurt her or them, she kind of just became desensitized to it, if you will. And then about 14 years of age, nearly seven years later, for whatever reason, they just randomly stopped seeing it all of a sudden. Until she got to about 1819, when this thing started appearing again, shortly after she had gotten married. Oh, I should include this, that my mother and father got married at 18, high school sweethearts, and they are still together to this day, almost 30 years later. It seems as though that once my mother and father became wedded and got pregnant with my oldest sister, things skyrocketed as far as frequency of encounters and sightings, even seeing multiple of these translucent men following all around their house, where we used to live when I was very little. And at this time, my grandparents had no longer had any more sightings. Whatever this translucent man was, he seemed very fixated on my mother and has never quite left her alone. Before I get to present day, let me finish with what was going on. So my eldest sister is born, then I'm born, then my younger brother is born, all within the span of seven years. All the while, sightings are frequent, but the behavior of this thing and these things is the same as when my mother was a child. Not aggressive at all, just curious, almost like it was watching my mother. 
watching over her, but from a distance. And obviously at this point, my father had had the chance to see this thing many times. And he too felt that this thing didn't pose a threat at all to our family. And I'm sure at one point or another, even considered it a guardian angel. Although I feel like that's a pretty far-fetched theory. I guess I could see why he would think that. Then, something crazy had happened. I was probably about nine or eight, sometime in that range. And my mother, I kid you not, literally vanished for ten days. Nobody knew where she was. In fact, my father had a nervous breakdown, thinking she had been kidnapped and was now human trafficked, or worse, dead. We all had just woken up one morning, and she was gone, nowhere to be found, no traces of her. The police got involved and nothing. It was impossible that she would go anywhere. All of her belongings were left in the house. Her clothes, nothing. The car was still here. There was no reason as to why she had just simply vanished. But then, on the tenth day, she appeared randomly at the edge of where our land starts, in foreign clothes we had never seen her in. They were weird, they were like loose gray and white robes, and she kept telling us everything would be okay, that she was fine. And between being overwhelmed with emotion and hysterics, we kept trying to pull it out of her. Where was she? What happened to her? Why was she in these strange clothes we had never seen her in? She just kept recalling that she really couldn't remember. That the last thing she knows is she was lying in bed and said this bright white light from the ceiling kind of engulfed her. And that was it. And then the next thing she knows, she's standing in this field, right outside where our house is. Couldn't even believe it had been ten days, either. She was pretty convinced it was all just a dream. I really don't know or have any evidence to point that these translucent beings had anything at all to do with my mother's disappearance for 10 days, but it certainly makes you wonder. Because directly after this, there's sightings of them being around our house, really amped up, for about the next 8 or 9 months, actually. We would all see them just about every other day, kind of just wading through the field, all around our house, day and night. There were moments that I'm not going to lie, it got annoying and pretty creepy. But this behavior continued on and on, to about the time I was about 18, 19, and moved out for college. A few years afterwards, the sightings have dwindled, and I guess the activity really kind of went down after I was out, and my sister and brother were also moved out too. As time has gone on, I'm 34 now, and my oldest sister is 37. My little brother is 30. My parents do not live in that house anymore, the one where my mother went missing. They have since moved since I have lived and moved out of high school. And since then, they have not had any more sightings or strange experiences with these translucent beings, these invisible outline humanoid figures. I, nor my siblings, have not seen them either, around the house, around our houses, or even in our dreams. Nor has anybody been abducted, taken, or had any strange experiences dealing with the paranormal, or in this world, that we can't quite explain. So, call it a paranormal experience, call it an alien experience. I'm not exactly sure what we dealt with. But I can confidently say it did happen, and it is by far the strangest thing. I and my family have ever dealt with. Although I've never actually seen a Bigfoot, back in 2019, around springtime, I was driving a dump truck for a construction company here in Central Florida with another dump truck driver who did. We'll just call him John. Just call me Sam. We met early in the mornings, often as a group, to go ahead and get instructions about our workday, and John usually was with his smaller inner circle of trust, drivers who were good friends of his, talking about his weekends, travel trips he's gone on, and hunting trips as well. When we started the day, 
we all talked on the same CB company channel to communicate and coordinate our movements throughout the day. And our department manager guided us to what construction lots to work and pick up and what lots to go in order to dump and such. We were very casual as far as talk and chit chatter. The boss just didn't like us speaking profanities and such. But of course, every now and then, we did. One particular week, I saw John talking to his little inner circle in the morning. He looked really wide-eyed and serious. Something really got his goat. But I couldn't hear what it was. Of course, though, in a group of just about 50 to 60 drivers in the company, it would eventually get out. Truck drivers gossip worse than a sewing circle. That's just a fact. They can't keep secrets no matter how hard some of them try. It will get out, eventually. A couple of days go by. About midweek, we gathered one morning, and the boss man divided us up into our group assignments, and we, the largest group of 30 or so, drove the designated construction lot to pick up loads of dirt and clay. And, of course, one of the loaders, of which were about three on this site usually, says on the CB, Good morning, John. Heard you saw yourself a Bigfoot last weekend while you were hunting. Ha ha ha. That's Bubba for you. Big, loud, obnoxious, and straight to the point. Things got quiet for a moment on the CB. Crickets. And no doubt Bubba and the others were snickering to themselves. He got called out. After a long pause, John told the story. He and his brother was out hunting somewhere in central Florida. I don't hunt myself, so I'm not familiar with the location of these places. And they happened upon a Bigfoot. It was still dark out. Early wee hours of the morning still. I think they were heading to a tree stand to scope out some deer. Anyway, they were heading to their hunting site, and as they entered into a clearing, they saw across from them, I think about 80 to 100 or so feet away, was a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch, a Skunk Ape, whatever you want to call it. Some natives call them Steyama. I found out after a couple of years of research, the Choctaw people, I believe, call them that. They both saw it, he and his brother. John and his brother just froze, you know. He said it was about seven to eight feet tall. It had a face that looked like a cross between a Neanderthal and an ape. Long arms down to its knees. Broad shoulders. It was covered in reddish-brown hair. They all stared at each other for what seemed like forever. John says because he lost track of time as it seemed to stand still. It finally just turned away and walked into the tree line, disappearing. The usual encounter which I've heard on so many channels. As long as you're not violent, they usually are not. John said he about pissed himself a little bit, and said they were about able to unfreeze their legs. They hauled out of there, pronto. Ran some speed and walked some. I think he said a mile or so back to his truck. Of course, we mocked the hell out of him, yeah, not cool, but we're truck drivers. What did he expect, you know? So, of course he had to defend himself. He had his brother there as a witness, too, who could vouch for him, and, of course, and some of the other guys wanted to hear from him also. Me, having so many supernatural experiences of my own, I felt he probably saw an apparition. Not a solid being, since part Cherokee. I've heard an interview with an old Cherokee chief that he believed Bigfoot was mostly a magical being, some type of elemental guardian. But, after a couple of years of studying and hearing so many accounts, especially the accounts on your channel and others, I've become a believer in Bigfoot being flesh and blood. Although I have heard of supernatural experiences with Bigfoot, disappearing right in front of people in a flash of light, being beamed down into the woods by a UFO, and being able to talk telepathically, and even them having connections with and working with fairy folk. 
I wonder too if they are supernatural beings and shapeshifters who take their form for whatever their own purposes are. The best solid evidences though that I've seen of facts and tangible things like videos and footprints was brought out on Survivor Man, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I feel bad about mocking John, who, like many other people, have experienced things like that, and we're supposed to be friends. When someone is your friend, they deserve at least the benefit of the doubt, not ridicule. After he got past his fear, John was saying he and his brother planned to go back to try and gather evidence, like footprints and hair, possibly even having another sighting. He was very serious about it. I don't know what happened because I left a couple of months afterward for a higher paying job 30 miles north, closer to home. From there, well, I didn't know him well enough to get his information, but I do have a couple of numbers of friends from there. Maybe I'll try and get an update on John's Bigfoot incursions into the woods someday. But seriously, after what I've learned in the past couple of years, I believe he really did see something. These particular incidents, which occurred on my family property to me, around towards the end of 2019 in Central Florida, when an unknown being that I can best describe as a very small impish-like thing, like a real gremlin or goblin, perhaps. I can't say for sure. There have always been strange occurrences on this property, since I was a kid, back in the 80s, due to a happenstance and unpredictable things occurring in my life. I had to move back here, staying at my mother's house. One night, while sleeping, I heard something open the closet door and scamper out. It actually climbed up the steps to the top bunk bed and was jumping up and down on the bed, squeaking the top bunk. It was really dark in the room, and I couldn't see very well, but it was small like a child and sounded bipedal. This happened three separate times. I was pretty freaked out about it and went to a camper dealership, got a used camper, and dropped it 100 feet from the house and moved in. I did not even bother to mention it my mom, who was 80 years old at the time, and can be quite difficult about talking about things like that. Anyway, I thought that would be the end of the problem, or so I thought. With all the weirdness going on in the world, I decided to stock up on extra supplies over time, at least three months worth of non-perishables, dried goods and canned goods, in case I could not go grocery shopping for some reason. One day, I decided to go check on some goods that I stored in the storage compartment. There's two ways into this compartment, which is either to lift the bed or unlock the small side door on the camper. I had about 10 gallons of emergency water under there and a large bag of dried dog food for my Maltese poodle, a gift for my mom. I discovered some damage. Two of the best brands of gallon water, which I likened, had been broken into, or should I say bitten into, that I had bought from a local drugstore. I had 10 gallons total of different brands, but these two gallons I liked the best. The best way I can describe it is if you're holding the handle on the edges or corners to the right of the handle, and to the left, on the left corner, was a very small bite mark, about the size of a quarter. It looked like something very small, with very sharp teeth, bit a quarter-sized chunk out of the side of that bottle, and the other bottle of the same brand also. Whatever did this had drunk at least half the two gallons, the jugs were partially squeezed and collapsed on top with too much force. This was no accident. Something did this. It also seemed like whatever did this either spit or blew small spatterings of this sticky brownish snot or spittle all over the other gallon jugs of water, but never damaged any of them. The dog food, too, 
had at least a half a dozen bite marks like that into the bag, and was eaten into each hole apparently. After I saw this, I cleaned up the mess and thoroughly checked the entire compartment from side, and I lifted the bed and did a pretty thorough search all the way to the back compartment. There was absolutely, positively, no way for anything to get into there. No holes, no nothing. No bugs or critters or anything in there, at least that could do that. I checked three times over. My camper is a good couple of feet off the ground, over just dirt. No brush or anything. There was no visible way in. I must admit, though, on occasion, I woke up in the middle of the night, about 3 a.m. or so, to hear, like, something knocking around in there. Over the previous week, of course. And one night, I woke up to something running across the roof. It sounded bipedal and small. It sounded like something was messing with my air conditioner. After it leapt off the roof, the AC made this irritating rattle sound, and it resonated through the camper, making it hard to sleep. I kept having to clean black mold out of it too very often after that. These sounds would happen always at night, and I'd wake up in that twilight zone kind of stupor. But eventually, it would quiet down, and I'd fall back asleep. One night stood out in particular when I woke to hearing knocking under the bed. I distinctly heard a loud, muffled hello. I heard something say that under my bed. It sounded like a child with a high-pitched voice trying to imitate Seinfeld from the hello episode. I jumped out of the bed, ran into the kitchen area of the camper. Safe to say, I stayed up until sun. I was freaked out. I sat up all night thinking, what was this? Eventually, the daytime came and I gathered up enough courage to go back there and check under, but found absolutely nothing wrong. I checked the side door again and there was no way in or out. It was locked. Time passed and everything had quieted down for a couple of weeks, besides the occasional nightmare, which always happens to me on this property. But other than that, no real creepy incidents. One evening, I went for a walk, got lost in thought for a while and lost track of time, when I realized I waited too long to go shower and hit the bed. Sunset fast approached, since this time of year, sunsets usually happen about 5.30, maybe 6 in late December. It took me a while to make it from the back property, up towards my camper. It was getting pretty dark by the time I made it back. And plus, it was cloudy. And there was a stored shed by the rear of my camper, and also a tent shed next to it that housed the farm tractor, and a small gap in between them. It's kind of like a little dark alley. As I passed the little alley, I heard a low-sounding, high-pitched, demonic-sounding snickering. I looked, and saw a shadow of something I could not see clearly. It was so dark in that spot, but it was maybe one to two feet in height, and had the outline of a pointed ear gremlin head and body, type goblin, or whatever you want to call it. All I can say is that in that second or two this occurred. <laughs> I got chills, freaked out, ran to my camper door, slamming the door behind me, and locking it. I should have known better than to stay out this late, on this old creepy property, because my experiences here as a kid, I'll never forget them. You can't just go out walking late, not after dark. As time went by, I did a little checking on the net and YouTube and other sites. I found some explanations from a Native American woman, who is also an archaeologist, and has lots of knowledge on the paranormal, and she said Beings like that do exist in usually small groups, but can and do act alone and exist in homes or near heavily forested areas, which there is one near my camper. The Choctaw lady has talked about fairies, elves, gnomes, gremlins, and other types of nasty little beings like pugwudgies, brownies, stick Indians, 
etc., etc. All that can go invisible and go spiritual. Walking through walls and going back solid again to eat or drink or affect things in the environment around them. She also knows a lot about Dogman and Bigfoot and many other kinds of cryptids. I don't know. This kind of stuff on where I live makes me nauseous at times. Makes my brain sore, but I have to learn to deal with it until I can do better and hopefully move far away from here. But for now, all I can do is pray I don't see that thing again. I really don't want to. I don't need a heart attack at nearly 50 years of age. I've still got plenty of life to live. Amazing how something so small can be so ridiculously scary. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't know how many years I've been able to see the creatures that live in the woods. It is just as far as long as I can remember. It certainly started when I was just a child. I was never frightened by them, likely, because they never appeared threatening. Not to me anyway. I think to start with, I thought they were fairies. You see, they were very small, and I was only a young petite girl, but some of them seemed not much bigger than my dolls. They never let me fully see them, just snatched glimpses here and there. I loved to play with them. I called it playing, anyway. Imagined it was a game of hide and seek. I wasn't as though they'd actively participate. I like to pretend that they enjoyed it too. They never showed me any malicious intent, yet even as a very young child, I seemed to instinctively know that I was not to talk about them, that I must never tell anyone of their existence. And I didn't. I honestly never felt the need to tell somebody. But. Those were simpler times, and as an only child, I would often spend hours in the woods as they were just behind the houses, close enough for me to hear my mother call me back for food. I had a good life. I often heard the word lucky being thrown around. We were lucky. Dad had that bonus and had bought us a VCR. We were lucky that our aunt had left my mother some money, and we went abroad on holiday. And I had my fairy friends. All would be fine, so long as I never told anybody. Whether I put two and two together and chose to ignore it, whether I honestly had no idea, I still didn't mention them to anybody that when some of the local pets went missing. Within the space of a few months, Two cats and one small dog, belonging to an older lady at the end of the street, disappeared and were later on found in the woods. When I say found, I mean parts were found. The majority of each animal had been eaten, covered in bite and tear marks. The locals thought it to be a fox. That was the only likely suspect. We don't have wolves, bears, cougars, etc. The worst that can then happen is you catch a chill, as the woods are always so cold and damp. But a fox can and will kill small pets. Just for fun sometimes. People were more vigilant, you know, just about keeping pets inside. And for a while, things seemed okay. And then the bad luck started up again. They called it bad luck, because it was little things that couldn't really be blamed on anything else. But there was still a particular tiresome issue. Flat tires. Missing food. Gardens destroyed. There was a spate of little occurrences over the next few weeks. And I could remember my mother standing on the doorstep, cup of tea in one hand, cigarette in the other, although she's given up years ago. She was chatting to the neighbor, who had huge bags under her eyes, about a noise that was waking her up every morning at 5 a.m. that she just couldn't get to the bottom of. That day, 
When I went into the woods, the little people didn't want to play. And that was when I started to get suspicious. So, I did something that an eight-year-old who was missing her friends seemed perfectly reasonable. Although now looking back as an adult, racks me with guilt. I took them an offering. Miss Stone had an old grumpy tabby cat who hated everybody. It was little more than a bag of bones with fur, as it was so old, and when it wasn't sleeping, it would just hiss at you when you walked by. When it was younger, and I was really small, it terrified me. So when I saw it sleeping on the doorstep, somehow, having snuck out of the house, I took my chance. It barely weighed anything, and couldn't even be bothered to scratch me just hissed a few times as I ran with it into the woods. I heard them as soon as I got to our spot. I had stood holding the cat and I heard the trees rustle. I knew they were there. They were watching me. I'm not exactly proud of what I did next. I threw the cat into the bushes and ran. Ran as fast as I could into my house up into my bedroom. A couple of days later, I heard my mom consoling our neighbor, saying it was likely the cat had wandered off to die, as they were apt to do. My neighbor was very attached to that cat, but she did receive some good news, that her son and daughter-in-law were expecting a baby after a year of trying. I stopped going into the woods as I got older, teenage life does take over. Then, I went to college and moved away. But, I still often hear about my mother talk about how you have to be careful if you walk through the woods using the shortcut to the shops. That there are often dead rabbits and squirrels around. Funny, that in all those years, they'd never actually seen what Fox was responsible for, though. I am a teacher in a primary school in the UK right now. Every year, we take a group of 11-year-olds to an outdoor recreation center, teaching them lifelong survival skills and team building. It's a lot of fun, and both the students and staff have a blast. As staff, we are always trying to find new activities to try out with the kids, testing their skills and mindsets it isn't always meant to be easy, sometimes doing something out of their comfort zone, but in a controlled environment is imperative in overcoming fear, which was how I found myself checking out some caves a few miles away, just from the residential center, and seeing if they would be safe enough and appropriate to use when we took the next lot of our kids up there in just a couple months. Now, of course, these were 11 year olds. Most of them will have never even seen a cave, let alone have gone spelunking. So we were not expecting them to suddenly become experts, but being taken into the cold and dark with the correct safety equipment and a trusted adult can alley any fears. I was all tooled up, resplendent with a hard hat and light attached in hiking boots. I hadn't planned to go too far, as in, although I had done this several times, one fall and you could be stranded. This was purely a reconnaissance expedition. Sometimes though, we got caught up in things and don't realize how far we've gone or how long it has been. Time seemed to fly by and there and before I knew it, I was pretty deep into a cavern of tunnels and quite away from the mouth of the cave. Of course, that would be the exact time the batteries in the hard hat started to flicker, indicating I needed to change them. Thank God I'd had the foresight to pack some more. It did mean that I was plunged into total darkness for a few seconds, whilst I removed one set and replaced them as quickly as I could. And in just those few seconds, I heard a noise now, 
as well as being a teacher and keen explorer, I am also an avid reader. And yes, horror is one of my favorite genres. So, upon hearing that noise, I can honestly say that the thoughts of Tommy Knockers and cave dwelling demons came to my mind pretty quickly. It was sort of a high pitched screech. Now, here in the UK, we don't have bears, or indeed any kind of man eating animals, that live in our cave systems. Bats, of course, but I hadn't heard of any flapping or felt the rush of wind from wings. So, I didn't think this was being made by them. Following all the classic foibles, I dropped the second battery and now had to scrape about in the dark to find it. The screech then turned into a growl, and I knew then for sure that I was not alone. Still grabbing around the floor, I could hear movement and I damn near crapped myself. Finally, I got the battery and managed to slot it in and turn the torch back on. I pushed my back up against the cave wall as far as I could, somehow imagining that it might protect me from whatever was here with me and making that noise. I knew I had to look before I made a run for it. I had to know what it was. So I turned and looked. I can honestly say two things. The first, I have never been more terrified in my entire life. And two, I have absolutely no idea what it was that I saw. Have you ever seen the film The Descent? Well, there are some cave dwelling creatures in that which are the only thing I can think of akin to what I saw. Lighting and shadow play a huge part and distorting size and features. And the fact that I was beyond petrified means that even my memories are now not 100% reliable. But the thing in front of me appeared to be of average human height. It was that same awful pallid albino color, same as the creatures in the film, appearing entirely hairless. I couldn't make out any eyes or even where the eye should be on its misshapen head. Only some sort of holes for a nose, and I presume mouth. It was on two feet, and appeared humanoid enough, like it had limbs like a person. Only the torso was deformed and twisted, and then it made that screech again, and I was able to pull myself out of my frozen and terror cliché and run as fast as I possibly could, back to the mouth of the cave and out of there. I only stopped running when I had reached my car, and even then, it was key in the ignition and go. I can't even recall when I stopped shaking. After I had climbed down, the more practical side of my brain took over, and I began hunting for a reasonable explanation for what it is that I saw. The air is thinner down there, and I had been in the darkness save for the torchlight for hours. After the mishap with the batteries, it was far more likely that I suffered some form of hallucination. Lack of oxygen, maybe. Lights playing tricks on my eyes. That must have been the cause. Just to be sure, though, I reported back to the school that the caves were dangerous. Too many potholes and chances of kids tripping and hurting. That was enough to knock it off the agenda. So we never took the kids there. And I have never been back. I mean, I'm 99% sure it was an overactive horror fan's imagination. Coupled with extenuating circumstances. But what if it wasn't? What if I really did see and hear that thing down there? I'm convinced I was, even though I try and force myself not to believe it. I thought I would send my story into you, and you can tell me what you make of it. I was around 12 or 13, the night we were driving through a storm, and I saw this thing standing by the side of the road. I was in the back of the car with my two younger siblings, who at the time were both fast asleep. 
my mother was driving, knuckles white from gripping the steering wheel so hard and on the verge of giving herself a migraine, just from concentrating too much. The rain was lashing down on the windscreen, and it must have been awful just trying to keep from falling over. My dad at the time was riding shotgun, desperately trying to read the map, face screwed up in concentration as he turning it around and trying to see any tiny markings with the only smallest amount of light. You were either lost or close to it, and they were trying to make as much time as they could, driving through the Pine Barrens, so we can try and find a B and B or a motel to stay in until the storm passed the next day. Thunder and lightning continued and decided to join the driving rain and high gust of wind. My poor mother jumped every time there's a clap, her speed sometimes reducing to almost a crawl. She was very aware that her three children were in the back of the car and she would do nothing to place us in danger. After another flash of lightning, I looked out my window on the passenger side, sitting behind my father. Since we were cruising along at the pace of a person, for a leisurely jog, I got a good glimpse of him, the creature on the road. Two strikes of lightning, one after the other, illuminated the sky in the area, just enough for me to be able to make out his features. He was tall, stood on two legs, just like a person, and as tall as a person, like my dad would be. He looked like he was gray, not wearing gray, as he wasn't wearing clothes, like his whole skin was gray. He had long skinny arms that were just dangling by his side. His head looked like a mixture, or maybe a horse and goat. I know that sounds weird, but believe me, everything about this thing was weird. And just to top it all off, I remember him having huge bat wings that again looked like they were covered in gray skin. Unbelievably, nobody else saw it. Okay, so mom was on the driver's side and mad concentrating on the road and not killing us. But dad... Even though he had his nose stuck in the map, I couldn't believe he hadn't noticed this thing, that his eyes hadn't been drawn to the road when the lightning struck. But it was just me. Looking back, I wish I would have shouted. Even if I had been told off for waking up my brothers and sisters, at least I would have had some sort of evidence. Validation. But, to be honest... I was too shocked and scared to even be able to speak. I turned around so I could see out of the back when there was another bolt of lightning. But the next strike wasn't as big and didn't light up the road as much. I couldn't see him. We weren't from that area, and until I did some research after we got home, I hadn't even heard of the term cryptid. But now, it would seem that I had a rare sighting of what I know to be the Jersey Devil. It is real. This one thing happened to me a few years ago and I will never forget and have never been able to explain. I'm running into you as I wonder if one of your listeners might be able to tell me something more about it or if they have ever had a similar experience I was driving someone from the gym, which I joined in town, and it was fairly dark, but not pitch black. I live a little bit out of the main town, out towards the countryside. At some point, in the journey, I noticed that there was a dog on the side of the road, just ahead of me. A very big dog. I was mindful of it, as the last thing that I wanted was for it to run out and also a little surprised that I couldn't see any owner anywhere. As I got closer to it, I could see just how large it was. More like the size of a small horse, but it was shaped definitely like a dog. Very wolf-like. 
It was also very dark in fur. Black, I would say. But it was really hard to make out. Mostly just the outline, in the absence of any real lighting. As I drove past, I remember thinking, I wouldn't want to take that thing for a walk. It stared right at me as I drove past, and I swear, although it sounds impossible, that it had glowing red eyes. But nothing has red eyes, right? I felt very uncomfortable, although I couldn't place why, and despite wanting to be careful to not run into this beast, I guess. Yes. Now, I thought of it as a beast due to the size. I also put my foot down on the accelerator to get out of there ASAP. And it ran. This thing ran alongside my car. I sped up to about 50 miles an hour. And that dog, it stayed with me. Not looking at the road, looking right into my car. Right at me, with those huge eyes. I sped up faster to 70, starting to feel out of control on that windy road, but needing to lose this animal. That was what it now felt like. There was no way this thing was something from our world. I was convinced. Finally, letting out a horrendous howl, like something you'd seen in a werewolf movie, it jumped off into the woods and vanished. I didn't let my speed up for more than a few seconds or miles until I was sure it was no longer beside me. I was still going too fast, but a speeding ticket was the least of my concerns right then. Thankfully, I made it home in one piece. The only thing I could think of was the Hound of the Baskervilles. You know, the old Sherlock Holmes story. I don't know what that thing was. But I can tell you with certainty, it wasn't a normal dog. It looked more like something sent straight from hell. Can you help me? I live in the Norfolk in the UK. Thanks. My wife and I had been fighting much more often. We both came home at the same time one Friday, looked at each other, just as soon as we felt the bickering washing up to the surface. And that's when we knew. We had to get out. Whatever it took. No matter how much work wouldn't get done over the weekend. We needed to get away from the hustle and bustle. And spend some time being around each other. In a way that didn't compel us to fight. I had been working just hard enough. Just long enough to own a little getaway cabin. About two hours away. It wasn't as remote as I would have preferred, but it would do the job. We arrived and settled in with Grace of a plane crash. There was no romantic carrying her over the threshold. We looked like two cats finding a place to curl up after crossing a warehouse full of rocking chairs. My wife hit the bed after we downed our Chinese food, and she was out pretty quick. We would catch up with each other in the morning, I suppose. I turned on the TV, making sure that my wife's slumber would not be disturbed. I think she could have slept through a helicopter landing at that point. I was just starting to feel my eyelids growing heavy when the sound of my wife's voice made me jump. She was calling to me. I snapped my head to her, but she was unconscious. Had she called me on in her sleep? No. It sounded too far away. But it couldn't have been anybody else's voice. She called me by my name. Then, I heard her call me again. Her voice was drifting in from the open screen window to the outside. She urged me to come outside to help her carry something. The only rational explanation was that either my wife had a twin who was standing outside or that the woman in the bed that I sat on was an imposter. She was the same person that had been with me all day, so I sided with her. I felt my forehead for any hint that I might be getting a fever and thus prone to any auditory hallucinations. But no, 
I felt fine. If it really was just some prankster or joker, then there wouldn't be any need to do anything. They'd get bored and move on. Well, they didn't. The voice of my wife grew more urgent, but still stayed as low, as if they were also making an effort to not awaken my real wife. When this glimmer of insight flashed into my brain, I decided to do just that. I gently nudged my wife and urged her to wake up. I almost thought that I wasn't going to be able to, but she gradually stirred, and I spoke to her to bring her up out of wherever she was. She wasn't happy to be bothered. I told her that somebody was outside, and they were calling to me by name, and they sounded just like her. In that moment, her eyes started to open. I heard a peculiar sound come from the window, the sound of compressed air escaping. I must have attributed it to our vehicle at first, because looking back, it sounded like some kind of hiss of frustration. Whoever, whatever was out there, must not have considered me to be very bright and seemed dismayed that I didn't rush headlong into their situation. I walked as quietly as I could across the floor and made sure the door was locked just in case our visitor was up for more than just mild monkey shines. The door held fast and I let go a little tension from my shoulders. When I turned around, my wife was looking at me wide awake. She could tell that I was serious. Then, both of us were jolted at the same time because a different voice came from down the hallway. It was the voice of our daughter. She was calling for us, the way any child calls after they've woken up after a bad dream. My wife, I'll never forget, put her hands to her face and let out a yelp before she can control herself. Me. I felt anger in an instant, but not without a measure of fear. There, my pulse became audible, and I followed the direction of the voice to the other bedroom. I jumped a second time when our daughter's voice spoke again. That's when I could see that the window in that bedroom was also open. I shut it, and that's when I heard a terrible commotion coming from where I had left my wife. She was yelling, one short step away from hysterics, judging by her tone. And there was the sound of the front door being pounded on and the doorknob rattling. I came running, as if I would suddenly find that the front door was unlocked. No, it held fast, despite the fury of the stranger on the other side. My wife was very unnerved at this point. I couldn't tell if I was mad or afraid. We hunkered down until morning, and somehow I managed to fall asleep even though I didn't think we'd be able to. We were both overcome with so much fear. When it was fully daylight, I stepped outside to see if our visitor had done any vandalism while we were locked in a standoff. Our car and everything was left alone. We did find some unusual footprints around the property and the places that I know for sure the stranger had stood especially under the other bedroom window. There weren't the footprints of anyone wearing shoes or boots, though. The weather had been dry, so the prints, sadly, weren't starkly cast in mud. But the prints we could find seemed to have three or four large toes. They looked very much like animal prints, which raised more questions than answers. Also, this detail is very disturbing. The prints we could make out appeared to be bipedal and not quadrupedal, meaning this thing was walking on two legs. The real problem was how they knew what our daughter sounded like. Bless her soul, she hasn't been with us for four years. 
she was killed by a drunk driver. Whoever this was that paid us a visit that night must have not known that something happened to her. Honestly, I don't know if this is some freak hallucination trip. Maybe my wife had slipped me some LSD. Or maybe we had some sort of supernatural traumatic experience. I'll let you decide for me. After way too many years of living in apartments, I could finally afford to buy a house. The house really wasn't much bigger than an apartment, but the difference is apparent to anyone that's been doing this as long as I have. One day, I would own it, and that day was going to be sooner than later, because I had saved plenty for the down payment. Most stories like this tell about something strange like a strange phenomena during the night on the first night. I didn't have that kind of trouble. It was a peaceful place, and I loved it. In fact, I slept soundly, knowing that one day it would be entirely mine in less than a decade. I got to know the places intimately as a child begins to know the layout of their own body. I didn't discover anything unusual except for what appeared to be the entrance to a crawl space underneath the house. The location was most peculiar. It was in the bedroom wall by the baseboards. Rather than crawling underneath the house like a proper crawl space, it seemed to go between the walls. It was very strange, and I had no idea why it was even necessary, although it was an older house. There was a lid, heavy enough to have been a component of a wood stove sealing the crawl space. It was held in place with four large screws. Getting those screws to turn, though, was murder. It was like they had been either over-torqued, or they had rusted in place years ago. But I got them off, and I shone a flashlight around the entrance to the crawl space. Nothing out of the ordinary. You know, like no skulls or bodies or anything like that. So I screwed everything back into place and paid it no more mind. The night after opening the crawl space was a strange one. I was about to drift off to sleep when I heard a very light sound that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was the slightest, most distant scraping sound. I woke up when it was followed by the sound of something hitting the wood floor. I was tired, and it was easy to write off as something I either dreamed of or something inconsequential. But I heard both sounds a second time when I tried to drift off. I turned on the light and looked around, unsure of what it was or what I was even looking for. I was always light on possessions. I didn't have anything to fall from anywhere. As I lay down, I heard the sounds return. It hit me. I got up and turned on the light. I took a look at the crawl space. Two of the four screws had been removed and laid on the floor, while a third one was sticking out, as if it were in the middle of being unscrewed. This began a game I had to play every night. The screws would unscrew themselves, and I would put them back in. This became a source of anxiety. I wasn't sure what would be happening if all four screws came undone. Suppose I were to sleep through such a thing. What would I be confronted with? No matter how I tightened or glued, I was still alerted to the mild grinding of the screws turning and then the thunk of them hitting the floor. This ate away at my nerves more than I care to admit. Not until I took the extra step of welding the screws in place, knowing full well that this would deny me any use of the crawl space. Did I get any peace, though? No. The first night after my new measure, I heard a bizarre sound coming from behind the place. Suppose you had the sound of someone crying, but it was done in whispers. There was a light tapping and scratching 
even after the strange sobs, and then the noise seemed to disappear. The anxiety from that experience has never left. There's a part of me that still listens for the screws turning when I'm drifting off to sleep. There was really no slow buildup to what happened to me. I was taking the garbage out into the narrow alleyway behind my place of work. Something about two heads shorter than me was rummaging around in our dumpster. The sound of the back door opening got its attention right away, and it fixed me with a face that seemed to borrow elements from both the insect kingdom and the reptile kingdom. The eyes were reptilian, but the overall structure of the body seemed to be as well. The shoulders were badly hunched. The frame reminded me of an armadillo trying to walk on its hind legs. The head was a few sizes too small, looking like a basketball with huge slitted eyes. The mouth reminded me of something you'd see on a praying mantis. It was when I saw that mouth that I couldn't help shouting an alarm. Again, just like a mantis, it was grinding away at whatever that it had found deemed edible. It might have been easier to stomach if I hadn't been wearing clothes. The clothing, however ragged, suggested that it wasn't just a dumb exotic animal. It was intelligent and incredibly hideous. It caught me off guard, and deep down, my instinct sent me into fight or flight. I must have had a similar effect on it, because it dropped whatever it was eating from its nubby clawed fingers, and let out this terrible scream, something that reminded me of a cicada when you get too close to them. It appeared to waddle backwards, the slits of its eyes I'll never forget. They appear to be darting about. Here's where it gets really bizarre. It stuck its hand out and appeared to do some sort of bizarre gesture. There was nothing for me to cease doing. I was counting its fingers as it was weirdly moving its hand about. I then felt something hit me all over the entire surface of my body, like a shockwave or a blast of heat from an oven. My vision was blurred and swam, and then literally every last object in my field of vision sprouted faces and screamed until I thought my skull would shatter. I curled up into a ball on the pavement, which was now swimming with screaming faces. After what felt like hours, I stood up, but it had only been maybe two, three minutes. Aside from questioning, what sort of living thing I had just encountered. I also wondered, had I just been on the receiving end of some sort of occult magic spell or hex, or perhaps some sort of pheromone or chemical attack, like a beetle that sprays liquid at a predator? Did that thing, whatever it was, use some sort of defense mechanism to incapacitate me? I searched my persons to find that no chemicals or other strange substances had been left anywhere on me or around me, which then guided me to the conclusion that it had used some level of sorcery or some sort of pheromone. As you probably know, this isn't really a story I can share freely, since our location is notorious for psychedelic drug use. I am one of the few people that have never tried any of this stuff. Whatever I saw was real. Whatever it did to me was real. It's not like I jumped at my own shadow. Just in case you decide to broadcast my story, I'm going to go on the record and say that I think I had come across something from one of the lowest castes in reptilian society. Even though it was foraging maybe, it still had a talent for deception and illusion which does line up with most of what I've read about reptilians. They aren't just out there. They're living everywhere without us knowing. We never even see them. Anyway, that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it.
I'm a retired park ranger, and I'm one of those rangers that they almost wouldn't let me retire because I was that good at everything I did on the job. I know every ranger says that, probably, and I don't mean to boast, but I've actually got papers and articles to back it up. If anyone vanished or disappeared on my watch, I'm the one that found them at the time, or at the very least it was my advice that led to them being discovered. I had a pretty solid career behind me, so nothing really shakes me up. Well, I got shaken up. Like all the heroes you see in a movie, I retired somewhere in the country, got a lot of animals. In my case, I settled for just a few chickens. You can't go wrong with fresh eggs. I got to know my animals just about as well as any cat or dog I could have owned. The first surprise was when I came outside one morning to check on my hens and saw the coop was a mess of blood and feathers. Now, chickens can be unpredictable in their own way. One minute they're okay and chill, and the next minute they're turning on one of their own, kind of like people around election season. But taking a closer look, I noticed that none of the surviving birds had any sign that they had taken part in the grizzly deed. The coop that I had constructed is solid. Once the gate is shut, there's no way in or out unless some animal was an absolute acrobat that could climb to the very top of three concrete walls, drop down that was shaped like a chimney. Actually, the coop had been a chimney at one point in time. The old house on the property burned down, and the stone chimney was all that was left but I had the inside of the chimney blocked off too, so nothing except for a very determined Santa Claus would have been able to climb up, jump down, and unseal the fence wiring that plugged the opening. I had just decided that the hens had been especially sneaky and vicious, and that they would get away with murder this time. Less than two days later, the same thing happened. Two more hens bit the dust, like I said, I don't have a very big congregation of chickens. This was beginning to eat into my daily egg production. The ground was still a little wet, so I did an inspection on the outside of my improvised chicken coop. I found something that didn't quite make sense. I did find footprints. Here's the thing. They were not animal. They were human they were also small like a child's. Okay, so there's a mischievous kid on the run. But why would he be out in his bare feet, so early in the morning in the middle of nowhere, where there's just my home? The second surprise came when I saw that the footprints were also found on the side of the chimney, all the way to the top. The footprints that were on the ground were also on the side of the chimney, meaning that the child had not shimmied his way up the chimney or grappled up the side. It was as if he had walked like Spider-Man. I started to feel a pit in my stomach that I couldn't place. It took me a minute, but I found the trail of tracks leading off my property. I was going to track them right back to where they came from, but they disappeared. So I backtracked, and found the trail of tracks where they originated. I followed my visitor's excursion backwards. This is the part where I can tell you only what I saw, not what I think, because there are some things that I avoid thinking about. The tracks led me down a lone road, and the further along I got, the thicker the timber became on both sides. And at one point, the trail eventually led off into the woods, to a thick area of brush that I couldn't get to, which means a small child would have no chance. I was clueless and terrified. What exactly I had been dealing with, I wasn't sure. Where I live is the literal definition of living out in the sticks. I don't have any neighbors for probably a good 10 miles anywhere close to me, 
and I live that far out there. So who or what on earth could it have been getting into my chicken coop? Like I said, I live very far out of any near community, so there's no excuses as to a child walking around late at night. I'm kind of freaked out. Back in January of this year, when it was still cold in the winter time, my girlfriend's family and I decided to have a weekend bonfire where we set out, cooked some barbecue chicken, and sat around the fire. Well, after the night grew weary, and my girlfriend's mom and dad and brother all retired to bed, it was just my girl and I sitting out by the fire, kissing, talking, and just staring off into the night. It was incredibly peaceful and wonderful to every degree until we heard a horrible, horrible roar that shook us both. This roar is far off in the canyon. On the back side of my girlfriend's father's house is a very, very large canyon that has woods separating the backyard from that canyon. Whatever this roar came from, it didn't sound like any animal I've ever heard of or I would want to meet. And not only was it loud, but it was incredibly deep. It had such low vibrations. You know how like if you've ever played bass and you're playing it through an amp and when you pluck a note, you could feel the vibrations hitting your body. It was kind of like that. Whatever animal made this sound had to have been of enormous size. And for it to carry out in the canyon like that, the way it did, for as long as it did, disturbed me and my girlfriend. That's another thing. The howl or roar lasted 10 to 15 seconds. It was incredibly loud. It did scare me, but it scared my girlfriend far more, to the point she was shaking, got up, put the fire out, and told me to come on. We're going in the house. And in the house we went. I wasn't going to argue with her. It freaked me out too. I was worried that whatever it was was going to come up this way, attracted by the only light surrounding the area, a fire. I'm glad we got out of there, and I didn't have to see what made this noise. At the time, it seemed like any typical disturbance of my cattle. Something had spooked them, and they were running, and mooing, and carrying on, so I grabbed my shotgun and went outside to take a peek. Come to find out that it was much more than a simple matter of them being spooked. I came across a few of my cows lying on the ground, bleeding out. So that's when I began moving with a purpose, if you get me. Even when it comes to predators like wolves, an adult cow can hold its own pretty well, unless it's sick or injured. So, my mind was working to figure out what could have gotten the best of some of my cows so quickly. I didn't have the time to perform autopsies. I rushed out to where the action was. My small herd was cowering from what looked to be a man. I yelled to it that I was armed and dangerous, and it didn't seem to hear. So I tried to get an angle where none of my cows would take any of the buckshot. Walking around the thing as it was lunging at my cows got me a full picture of what it was that I was exactly up against, and it wasn't pretty. It was just like the pictures you see in some of the pyramids, the ones with the dog god thing. It just wasn't wearing fancy clothes. But it looked every bit like the pointy-faced black dog that walked around on two legs. I think they call it Anubis, but I could be wrong. It appeared to have that really sleek and pointed snout and muzzle. The eyes were wide open and clearly flushed with adrenaline. It slashed at my cows with claws that were very long. I almost wondered how it avoided cutting itself. I finally got to an angle where I could take a shot and see what would happen. 
The cloud of shot pelted the monster, and fur blew away in a small cloud of blood. That's when I had its attention. Narrow as the head seemed to be, the teeth were long, and I could see just how long because it bared them at me in a special shade of anger. Despite the shock of the wound, it tried to charge me. So, I let it have it with the other barrel. That should cut deep enough that I could see chinks of bone peeking out. It kept howling, in a horrible pain, but just kept coming. I was doing a number. I still had time to chamber another two shells and let them go. The volley shredded most of the meat off of its head. And somehow, the thing kept staggering towards me. I chambered two more shells. And ladies and gentlemen, that was all she wrote. Thing was, after that shot, there wasn't anything left to share with the press. I had a skeletal mass of pulp and vaporized tissue. If I reported this, there was a solid chance that it could be misconstrued as a human body. Then, who would look after my cows? I could be facing some serious prison time, and nothing I could say would change that. So, I more or less took the loss of my cows for the sake of my personal freedom. I try to use the slain as much as possible, but there's only so much beef a farming family can eat. Anyway, that's my story. You're free to use it if you'd like. I live outside the incredibly small town of Weaverville in Northern California. Basically, I live in the sticks, and I believe I saw something, some kind of animal, some creature, that I'm not quite sure what it is. I can't explain it, but the only description I can give you is that it resembled that of a Great Dane, except standing up on two legs. The only connection I have is when I grew up, I was very close to my aunt. She always had two Great Danes with her. My entire upbringing, any time the pair would die or one would die, she would buy another. It was very odd, so that's always stuck out to me. And what I saw that night closely resembled that exactly of a Great Dane. In fact, I even suspected it at first and was wondering how weird it was that it was walking around. But on closer inspection, even though it was as large and as tall and lanky, it resembled more of a coyote from what I could tell. Very, very slender. Its legs were a little more muscular than that of a dog's, but still had the hawks and everything. It stared at me from the wood line, kind of glowing red orbs of eyes, but not like monster red. They were just a warm red glow, an unnatural glow at anything. I wasn't really afraid as much as I was confused. It seemed to be watching me very nervously, like it had got caught doing something and was waiting for me to leave. I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, but that's the vibe I got from it. At the time, I was in my backyard, splitting firewood, when I happened to look up and see this thing staring at me. My backyard isn't the largest, but those trees go on for quite a while. I want to say another five, six miles. I could be way off, but I know it's a ways back there. I've only seen this animal once, and this was about three months ago, right in the height of summer. I have never seen it since, nor heard of it. I have no idea what it could be. From what I know, it could possibly be some sort of rabid wild dog, although I've never heard of rabid wild dogs around here and by themselves, and especially ones that look like Coyote Great Danes. Hi, What Lurks Beneath. Absolutely love your channel. And a close friend of mine actually has their own horrifying war story to share that somehow involves these dogmen. I had them type it up and send it to me. 
and they've given me their full permission for me to send this to you and you to read it. So, feel free to read it to your audience if you'd like. Anyway, I've copied and pasted this story in, so here you go. My battalion was pushing into Al-Qaeda stronghold, which was a little more than a few city blocks of super thick buildings. It was no fortress, but the tactics they used could try the nerves of any soldier. More than once, I saw my men charged by children that had explosives strapped to their backs. If they ran back where they came from, they'd be shot by their captors. If they ran towards my men, they had to decide if they could live with sacrificing a child for the lives of their fellow soldiers. It was a dire time, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. The further we pushed into the stronghold, the more we got to see just how old the quarter of the city was. It seemed to be so old that it was mostly uninhabited, and not just due to the occupation by this group. We managed to get by what we had thought was an established perimeter. We found it completely left open, with no security whatsoever. Very sloppy compared to what we usually got from them. We went down a dark alleyway that was so narrow that we had to proceed in single file. That put us at a disadvantage tactically, but what else were we going to do? We were used to hearing voices rattling off something in, say, a language we didn't recognize. Instead, we heard something different that actually got us and made our skin crawl. It sounded like a howling noise, followed by a snarling, and then a yelping or a barking. It sounded nothing like people and everything like animals. The flashlights on our M16s showed us that we were in a courtyard where a dried up fountain stood in the center. There was a sculpture in the fountain and it didn't make sense at the time. But looking back, I am chilled by the memory even further. It was a woman with the head of a dog. We had no idea that it was a bit of foreshadowing of what was to come. We soon saw movement Bodies were crawling down over walls and leaping from windows into the courtyard with us. We were too tactically engaged to notice they weren't human. Bear-sized bodies with the shapes of drooling, snarling wolves became more and more evident. It was like a badly written sequel to Teen Wolf with unlimited stunt doubles. The mission parameters instantly narrowed to preserving the detachment we opened fire on the monsters, and they didn't exactly melt at the touch of live ammunition. They did eventually die, but it was more like they were succumbing to bee stings than bullets. They were able to absorb a ridiculous amount of gunfire before they refused to move anymore. It's rumored that the Iraq War might have ended sooner if we hadn't been pushed back so hard. But in this instance, these weren't terrorists. These were animals, and they were unusually tough. The reports connected to that mission were never released, especially publicly. The U.S. would never gracefully accept a report that her troops were pushed back by wild animals during a key mission. Most of our internal commanders didn't accept it either. Anyway, that's my story. So there you go. There's this story that I had him tell me and write down and send to me. I know the guy personally. Very honest, hardworking. Has done multiple tours over to Iraq. I don't know the exact number, but I'm pretty sure it's like three, four, or maybe five. He's got his experience. Anyway, I hope this is at least interesting. Have a good day. Hi, my name's Roy, and I have a story to tell you from my childhood. So, I grew up with an older brother. At the time of this story, I was seven, and he was nine. 
We used to play all the time in the spring and summer in a very large patch of woods directly behind our house. We spent hours and hours back there playing together, playing swords with sticks, building tree forts, pretending to start fires, cops and robbers, you name it. We spent hours exploring, looking at bugs, trying to find buried treasure like any kids do. You know, all the stuff. We tried to spend the majority of our free time outside when we could, mainly because inside offered us no entertainment. My parents didn't have any TVs, no game systems, nothing. We had a few books here and there, but nothing my brother and I were interested in. So we try and spend all of our time outside and live like real kids do. But that changed halfway during a summer when I was seven and he was nine. We were out playing, and I remember we had a game of hide and go seek. Well, I was it, and so I counted to 50. This time, before I could even finish counting, he comes back running, screaming all the way back to the house. It completely caught me off guard and by surprise. Then, I thought he was pranking me or trying to joke with me, and so I laughed and ran after him. But he was just bawling hysterically, crying, screaming, running to the back door. I chased after him and tried to get him to slow down, but he didn't. He didn't even acknowledge me. He was in a total state of shock and fear. When he got to the back door, I finally caught up with him. My mother was busy doing something, so it took her a minute, if not more, to get to the back door. She usually kept it locked. I had never seen my brother in my life so overtaken by a pure raw emotion as that is fear. It wasn't until a little later, even my mom was freaked out, that she was able to fully get him calmed down. But it was days before he would tell any of us what exactly happened. He just kind of said he saw something, but we really couldn't get anything out of him. Then, days after that, he told me what it is that he saw. It had been about a week, and he asked me if I could keep a secret, and I told him yes. Even more so, being only seven years of age, you want to do anything to be by your brother, and him and I are very close, still. So he told me that he saw a real-life werewolf as he ran to hide. It was walking up to him from behind the tree, reaching out to grab him, from what he said. He said it was big and hairy, covered in dark black fur, with huge fangs and large eyes and ears. It scared him so bad that he ran away. He was pretty serious about it too. He was very shaken up about it, retelling the story at nine years of age. Plus, he had no desire to go back and play in the woods for the rest of the year, which was a huge loss for both of us. So we just kind of stayed inside and were bored the rest of the summer. Now that we're older, and both in our later 20s, I'll ask him about it sometimes. And he basically just tells me what I told you already. That he believes he saw some sort of creature that resembled the werewolves. He's pretty firm on his belief that vampires, mummies, werewolves, those don't exist. But there can be animals out there that have the same resemblance as made-up Hollywood creatures. I mean, that's a lot more plausible than the idea of an actual werewolf existing. So, as he went on to describe it to the T, basically said exactly what he did when he was nine. It stood up on two legs, covered in dark black fur. He said it was really thick, kind of like a shaggy dog, long and gangly and very unkempt like it had been rolling around in dirt and filth and muck. And he said its face was somewhere of a cross between a German shepherd and a wolf, a very pronounced brow ridge, kind of like some monkeys do, and very, very long ears that were very pointed and a long muzzle and huge, sharp canines. This thing was walking towards him, extending both of its arms, like it was going to grab him, but it made no effort to run after him or move any faster than a casual slow pace, even after he started running. The whole thing is weird, he tells me, 
but it is what it is. The following spring and summer, we continued to play back in those woods and never had any problems afterwards. We moved out of that house and all the way across town when we were 15 and 13, right around high school age. Anyway, that's my story, or I should say my brother's story. I never saw or heard or seen anything. I was forcing myself to go camping because I was out of shape at the time, and I knew that if I did not develop a taste for fresh air and something like exercise, I was going to have a miserable last stretch of my existence. I'm also kind of a hypochondriac, and I'm only 36. Several of my friends got a camping trip together for old times' sake. Old times that I were never part of, because I was far too afraid of the outdoors. So, I went along. It didn't do too bad, except I couldn't stand to be far away from anyone for too long. There was something about being by myself outdoors that made me feel exposed and uncomfortable. I think my friends took turns pawning me off onto each other, as if they were some collective group of babysitters. I had a breakthrough when I was moved to stand and stare at a pond that we discovered at the campsite. For a moment, I forgot about being afraid, and I forgot about being alone. The bad part was, when I finally started paying attention to what was around me, I found that I was alone. That's when the first wave of panic hit me. I frantically looked around for somebody, anybody that would be nearby. I heard some movement in a nearby cluster of trees, and I was pretty sure that my friends couldn't have gone very far. Nor did I think it likely that they would deliberately abandon me, considering my mental state. I didn't stop to think about the possibility that it could be somebody that I didn't know, or a bear, or worse. It was worse. It turned around in time to look at me, and I think for a half second, we both wore the same expression of confusion. This thing walked on two legs, but was no human being. It looked down at me from a very thick bear-like neck and head, that was plunged onto hunched, huge shoulders. The face resembled somebody trying to crossbreed a dog with a pig. Some of its teeth protruded like tusks, but it had the black nose and a smashed face of a hog. The ears were weird as well. They were very long and very rough looking, like they were torn apart. I'm sorry, that probably doesn't make any sense. They were kind of gross. I picked a random direction, and I just ran. I thought it was running behind me, but I couldn't tell the sounds of my footsteps from it. My friend is no trouble finding me, as much as the screaming as I was doing. They say that I was screaming, something about a giant dog. Evidently, they didn't see what had been behind me. I asked them about it, and none of them saw anything. Perhaps the thing was just as startled by me as I was of it. But I know nothing of what I saw. I'm merely only guessing. And I thought it would be best if I reached out to you, since you seem to have answers and know exactly what these people deal with. Based on the descriptions that I gave you, what is it that you think I saw? I was just a kid myself, the first time my little sister told me about her pet. We all presumed it was just some imaginary playmate that she had created, since we weren't allowed pets in the apartment complex. She talked for hours about Doggy, and how she only saw him at nighttime, and that he was her special friend. She took it quite far as well starting to sneak bits of food out of the fridge or save bits of her supper to take out to him. We lived in a second floor apartment and although she wasn't allowed to go down 
into a shared yard where it was dark. Our mom had a small balcony from her bedroom. So, she'd go there to see Doggy and give him his treat. Sometimes I'd ask if I could come see him too, and she'd shake her head no. Doggy won't come if he sees anybody else, she'd tell me. So serious and solemnly, it was almost compelling. This went on for years. Sometimes, there would be a complaint about some dirt having been kicked up in the yard, or the trash cans knocked over. One time, there were even scratch marks on the outside of the balcony, and again, Doggy got the blame. In the end, I had to know. I knew there couldn't be anyone in hell that my little sister actually had a dog that only manifested at nighttime and was somehow big enough to reach our second floor balcony. It was absolutely 100% impossible. I also knew that she wouldn't let me go and see Doggy, so I just have to sneak. So that evening, after supper, I clutched my belly and said I needed a visit to the bathroom. I might be a while. I remember seeing her pocket a sausage from her plate, so I knew she was going straight out whilst mom cleared dishes. I shot out of the room, but instead of the bathroom, I raced into my mom's bedroom and hid in the closet. Then I waited. Sure enough, moments after, I heard her come in and slide open the balcony door. Then I heard her. As quietly as I could, I opened the door. I remember thinking at that point, my sister should get into performance art as the panting and snuffling noises coming from the balcony sounded very realistic. Then, I saw it. Doggy. I don't know how tall it was, whether it was standing on something or strong enough to have climbed up and to hang onto the railing, but I could clearly see its face in the shadows, thanks to the security light. It was definitely some kind of dog but unlike anything I had ever seen. It was slightly obscured by the railings, but I can make out that it was eating the leftover sausage with one of its hands, because this dog had long arms and hands kind of like a person, but a definite dog head and face and had yellow, dull glowing eyes. Staring at my sister, I was frozen in terror. This dog thing looked like something that had been released straight from hell. Yet she didn't seem one bit afraid. She had reached through the railing and even tried to pat it. It honestly could have killed her in an instant. I could see the veins and muscles throbbing through its giant hair. But instead, looked at her. Leaning over the railing, she said bye to her pet and said see you later. And just like that, she walked back out of her mom's room, not noticing me. I waited for another moment, and then, overcoming my fear, I tiptoed out of the balcony and peered over the railings. I heard a low growl that made my stomach turn to water, and I could tell you that I really did need the bathroom then. The next evening after supper, she came back to the table after going out to see this thing what she called Doggy, with a look of disappointment. He wasn't there. Mom had ruffled her hair, had said not to worry, but he never came back. Whether it was a coincidence, or whether that growl was a message, that he'd been betrayed or something, I don't know. But we never had another visit, and my sister never talked about it again. I've even tried to get her to mention it, and she somehow knows no idea what I'm talking about. But, I know what I saw. Sometimes I have to remind myself that monsters are indeed real. I feel like I'm living in a Goosebumps book sometimes. I think the only reason that this creature was even coming around was basically because my sister was feeding it, and quite well. She would bring a lot of food out there. It wasn't just like scraps or half a sandwich. 
It was a lot. This thing never acted friendly in a traditional pet sense, but it did act neutral. Again, if you're offering something a food source, it makes sense that it's going to lure it in. I'm just surprised it didn't take her, for whatever reason. A few months ago, I decided to do some urban exploring. It's something that I had been really interested in for a while, but just hadn't gotten around to actually doing anything about it. I'd gotten as far as buying a kit for it, and doing the investigation. You know, surveying a spot, checking for security. I just hadn't had the right prerequisite kick up the butt to get up and actually doing it. Then, I had a massive fight with my then girlfriend, in which not only did she dump me, but was also quite cutting in her remarks. That was my catalyst. So, off I went. Only, things didn't quite turn out as planned, as they never do. Being a bit of a horror buff, one of the criteria was when I was selecting the location of my first urbex, was the likelihood of it being haunted. The prospect of actually seeing a ghost and catching it on camera, and then of course, putting it on a specially created YouTube channel in which it goes viral and makes me famous, would be just what I needed to shove in my ex's face. So, an abandoned school seems so ripe for the potential for creepy ghost kids. Plus, there was some urban legend attached that suggested the old headmaster had hung himself, which is why it was now derelict. I couldn't find anything to validate that, but it was good enough to go on. Man, I was psyched. I really wanted to see something. And they do say that you can will stuff to appear, if you believe. That apparitions are far more likely to manifest to a believer. So, I was armed with a camera that had a decent night vision mode and off I went. Now, it is all very well planning these things. You can read about it. You can hear people talking about it. You can even see it on various websites. But actually, being there in the middle of the night, all on your own, is quite different. And I'm not afraid to admit that it was certainly unnerving at the very least. Yes, I was excited, but I was also bricking it. I could feel malevolence oozing from every corner, but I forced myself to keep going and not turn around and flee, unlike some sort of chicken. Further and I went, I'm not exaggerating to say it, that it absolutely stank in there, like wet dog and years and years of mud. But it smelled like every local animal that had used it as a toilet, especially dog urine, especially. I had to keep the light pointed at the floor most of the time, just to avoid piles of fecal matter. And it was rank. I'd just go about into the furthest accessible point when I heard a growl. This is in England, by the way. We don't have wolves, or bears, or mountain lions. There's not a lot of animal life that can really hurt you, especially if you're a full-grown man. At most, it might be a fox who, although I wouldn't want to knit me, would likely be frightened off by the light right in its furry little face. Then I heard it again. I've never actually heard a fox growl. I've seen them sniffling around the bins, and I know that a vixen makes a god-awful racket when she's in season but I have yet to hear anything growl like this. Your mind does crazy things when you're on hyper alert, and I started to question the last time there had been a wolf sighting in the southwest of England, despite knowing it had likely been well over a hundred years, telling myself that it had to be some sort of dog that had run away from home and was probably threatened thinking I was challenging him for the rat supply. I shone my light over in the general direction of the noise, and I kid you not, I very nearly added to those piles of crap all over the ground. Over in the corner, 
what, what at first I thought might have been a werewolf. That was honestly the first thing my mind went to. But since it wasn't racing at me, with its claws and jaws out, ready to eviscerate me, I inferred that it wasn't going to kill me. Just yet, anyway. And that reasoning allowed me just a little bravery, or stupidity, whichever you feel is most applicable, and I took a second look. This thing was huge. It was taller than I, and definitely more broad. It looked to be made of pure muscle, except I could quite see it as covered in dark, matted fur. It had long legs and arms just like a person, which had made me originally jump to the werewolf theory. But getting a second look, I could see the head was not wolf-like, although it had been an easy mistake to make when it's dark. It was more like a dog, kind of like a German shepherd. And that is when it really sank in. Even if this wasn't about to be Dog Soldiers Part 2, there was still a freaking massive dog person in the same room as I was. That's when it let out a low, guttural growl, and that was enough for me. I legged it, ran as fast as I could. I didn't give a crap about filming or documenting anything. I just wanted to make it out alive. I have no real idea exactly what I saw down there. I went in hoping to see orbs, or feel cold, or something spooky. But whatever the hell that was, whatever creature that was, it wasn't a ghost or supernatural. It was very real, and I will never be returning to that spot. I have no answers for what animal I have witnessed that night. I have you for what I think is a dogman story, although we are still not 100% sure. I'll tell you my story anyway, and let you decide for yourself what you think, since you seem to be an expert on the topic. It actually even sounds like some sort of urban legend as I tell it, but I promise you, this is true. My boyfriend and I both come from fairly religious backgrounds, with very strict parents, and even stricter rules about being in the house together doors open at all times kind of stuff, which is all well and good as we respect our family, but when you're 17 and want to be together, you need to be inventive. So it was back to old fashioned parking, finding a secluded lane somewhere we wouldn't get busted by anybody, nosy neighbors, cops, so we could enjoy ourselves in peace. We were both into scary stuff, and it even joked about the Texarkana stuff, where the hook man decided to prey on the lovers lane couples. I hope the hook man doesn't come. We'd be joking before getting the windows hot. Then one night, something happened. Only this time, the thing that came didn't have a hook. We found what we had thought was a perfect spot to be alone. An old country road surrounded by thick woodland that didn't really seem to go anywhere. It was unlikely anybody would use it unless they actually wanted to park up here. We'd been coming up here for a couple of weeks, and so far, the only slight interruption we'd had was barking, which we assumed was coming from one of the nearby farms, which were far for us, but close enough that on a still night, you could hear them. A few times, they seemed to be really going mad. There was so much barking, it almost put us off. This time, however, the barking and now growling seemed a hell of a lot closer than normal. Of course, even though I mentioned this, my boyfriend was adamant that no dog was going to stop us. He even seemed a little jumpy when we had heard a bark that must have come from the woods, not as far from the farm but he was still insistent. Even if there was a dog running around in the trees, it wasn't going to do nothing to us. Well, I wish I'd have the good sense to listen to my own senses, as lo and behold, just a few moments after that barking 
that already sounded way too close for comfort, came growling. A low and tense, and way, way too close for the car growling. Followed swiftly by a scratching noise on the side of the vehicle. I was beginning to scream. I honest to God thought that the actual real hook man was out there, and he was going to rip open the car and gut us. What else would be making that noise? My boyfriend began panicking and did the only thing he could think of in the moment. He turned the headlight on full beam and hit the horn. I don't know if it was the sudden shock of the light, the sudden blast of the horn, or both, but the thing outside that was making the growling and scratching noises froze outside of the driver's side window for just a second, but that was long enough for us to see what it was. It was as tall as the car, and broad like a wrestler, covered in hair. It stood up on two legs like a person, and was really hairy. This wasn't a person though. It very clearly had an animal head. A dog had to be precise. It kind of reminded me of one of those dogs from the canine units the police use. I don't know what breed of dog it is. He looked right at us through the window and turned around and casually left. When I say he took off, I mean he was there one second and gone in the next. It was like he's faster than any Olympic runner. My boyfriend quickly jumped in the seat and hit the gas and we were out of there, still barely clothed. He called me the following morning to say he'd been out to check the side of his car just to see what damage there was now that it was daylight. He said in the side of his car were four real deep indented scratches looking like a damn bear or wolf had tried to gouge out the panel. I still don't know exactly what we saw. Parts of me want to think it was some kind of hellhound sent us to stop from fornicating, but that's just my religious upbringing. The rational side of me has honestly no clue. I saw it close enough that I can confirm it was for sure not somebody in some costume, but the side that spent hours driving down the YouTube wormhole makes me think it might have been something more evil. I work in security in this very well-to-do neighborhood. It's a pretty good gig, but to be honest, not a lot happens. And although the houses are large and no doubt full of valuables, any would-be burglar would have been crazy to attempt a break-in. These rich people got top-of-the-line CCTV, motion lights, alarms. They're inside, some probably armed to the teeth, rigged up to 911. So most of the time, I just drive around, waving at people and checking that delivery drivers move off quickly. Then, one night, I get a call from one of my favorites, saying her backyard light keeps coming on and there looks to be a strange dog trying to get in the house. She had chihuahuas, I guess, and I'm guessing whatever was sniffing around outside the fence knew that. She instructed to bring a big gun and told me it's a big dog. I'm not really afraid of dogs. I always fancied a detail with a canine unit, but I ain't stupid. I might not be afraid, but that don't mean I'm going to head over there with the intentions of petting this thing. Huge dogs did not sound like something I wanted to be around more than I had to. So, I wandered on over, big gun and big flashlight in hand. I sneak around to the back of the property where she said she could see the creature or dog via the security light. And I whistled, calling it over and hoping it wasn't actually that big, that it would just be some dog I could take to the pound and get on with my night. Maybe it was one of the neighbor's loose dogs. I could hear some rustling and a growl. Not the best sign. I pulled out some sausages and still trying with a flashlight. Then my eyes saw this thing for what it was. 
The lady had been correct when she said this was a big dog. It was nearly larger than me. Not really taller, but skinny and very mangy looking. It also stood upright, like a person, panting, with very heavy labored breathing. Its head and face very much so reminded me of a jackal. I yelled, grabbed the gun, intending to shoot it when it ran. I've never seen anything move that fast before. I gave a little chase, but I couldn't even tell in which direction it had gone. I spent the whole night looking, trying to figure out what it was. Anyway, that's my latest and greatest encounter. I was playing Nerf guns with my older brother back when I was a little kid. I was far too little at the time to know that he wasn't coming to get me when I was hiding behind a rock for too long. He was using it as a chance to get rid of me so he could go back to playing video games, tricking me into playing Nerf Wars with him, waiting for me to hide, and shooting at me just enough so I would. And then as I waited for him, one turn, I went deeper into the woods behind our house and waited even more for him to show himself. I must have been one of those children with superhuman patience because I sat there waiting until the sun was starting to go down. Only then did I get it through my thick skull that he wasn't coming and I needed to get home. My path was intercepted by an animal that was walking on two legs instead of four. This scared me. It wasn't looking at me, but it was sniffing the air every few steps it took. Looking back, it had an exaggerated oversized head with the general features of a Doberman pincher. That is, if the fur were more wild and the markings less distinct. It was all teeth and claws, and I thought better of distracting it. I told my brother about it when I got home, of course, after chastising him for not coming home after me. He turned pale at the word of the story, but nobody else really believed me. He did, though. I wondered about that for a very long time. He did confess later on, much later when I was older, that he had run across the same towering dog-like beast. When he heard that I had encountered it, he was hit by a pang of guilt and thought it was incredibly fortunate that I was still alive. I have done my own homework now that I'm older, and apparently, it's not unusual for this humanoid dog to spare the lives of humans. Still, it's a chance I'd rather not take. <laughs>